Hello, my friends. I hope you have a nice long drive ahead of you or maybe a nice long walk that you're going on because today's episode is a big one. (laughs) It's also a really juicy episode. I've got Brian Hood on. He is the host of the Six Figure Creative Podcast, which is a fantastic podcast, not just for photographers, but for creatives and freelancers of all kinds. And today we're talking about a concept that he has talked about before on his show that I really love, and it is the six levels of freelancing. And regardless of whether you are brand new as a photographer or have been in business for ages and you're, you know, you've got it all dialed in, I think that this episode is going to be really eye-opening for you because it basically spells out the sequence of events that happens in just about any freelancer's business that takes you from beginner to very well-established professional and even beyond. And I think that by identifying those steps and understanding where you are on that scale, you are going to be able to more clearly see what you're aiming for next and sort of get a preview of what's to come which I think is one really important way to prevent yourself from getting stuck and burned out. So because this is a long episode, I'm not going to give you anything further. I am just going to turn it over to our conversation. It was a really great one, and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to This Can't Be That Hard. My name is Anami Tonkin, and I help photographers run profitable, sustainable businesses that they love. Each week on the podcast, I cover simple, actionable strategies and systems that photographers at every level of experience can use to earn more money in a more sustainable way. Running a photography business doesn't have to be that hard. You can do it, and I can show you how. Brian Hood, welcome finally to This Can't Be That Hard. It is so great to have you on the show today. How have you been? I have been awesome. It's been, I've been wanting to be on your show since I had you on my show like over a year ago. So totally hey, it's finally nuts. happened. Better it's finally than ever, happened. Right? And it's not going to, it's not going to be another year before it happens again, because when we were going back and forth, you sent a few ideas of things to talk about. And I literally could not choose. This is almost like I just threw a dart at the dartboard, but like, I'm pretty choosy about the podcast that I listen to. You always have such great stuff. And I love that you speak to creatives in sort of in a more general way as opposed to and you come from a sound engineering background right music Um, production but yeah music production sorry this is like my brother's a furniture maker and if i call him a woodworker he's like seriously what's up why (laughs) like i'm sorry (laughs) i just don't know that space very well but i love because so many of these business strategies and and thoughts and whatever um apply to multiple fields and creatives in a larger sense generally aren't great at all of them. So anyway, you and I have all of those things in, uh, I like to think in common. So I'm excited to have you on today. Yeah. To talk. I mean, that's the, that's the basic thesis of the podcast is yeah. I learned the hard way in the music production space that when I look to my peers for what I should do, all I found was more examples of what I shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. And I found what I should do from all the other creative industries. And so mm-hmm. I decided like, I need to learn from everyone else. And, and truth be told, not just creatives and freelancers, yeah. I even branched out further to other broader markets like software and other kind of places that have figured out marketing better mm-hmm. to learn these things. So that's, I try to bring all that back to our audience, at the Six yeah. Figure Creative Podcast. Yeah. I talk, I mean, one of the things I remember learning in photography when I was starting out was if you are looking for photographic inspiration, maybe get out of the photography space, go to a museum and look at some fine art, go to a, you know, go see a movie and you know what are they doing in cinematography these days how does that translate to your to your still photography so i think that getting a little bit out of our you know tiny little niche can be really good too so today we are the dart landed on the dartboard at talking about the six levels of freelancing so i want to kind of jump right into what you know where you came up with this and and what you mean when you say that yeah, so <clears throat> this actually came from a podcast episode I heard in the software space because I have two software companies and I learned a lot about that world over the years. And the podcaster was just talking about the six, like the six phases or steps 
in a software business. And so naturally my brain goes to the same thing in my own world and freelancing mm-hmm. is like, what are the six, what are the six steps or the six levels in our world? Place yourself on the, on the, the ladder here, if you want to look mm-hmm. at it that way and think through what do we do to get to the next level as a freelancer? Because no matter where you are as a listener right now, you're, you are most likely, unless I miss something <laughs> horribly here, you are most likely on one of these six levels. And unless you're on the final level, which is very small percentage of people, then there's always the next level to get to. And truth be told, even there's some past level six that I haven't even achieved myself. So I, <laughs> I, sure. I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> well, good. Okay. So let's start out as one would with level one. Talk to me about where somebody comes into the freelancing space. Yes. Okay. So uh, level one is what I call the yes mode freelancer. And so any, it's like, you remember back when you first started, I remember when I first started and anyone that I've ever talked to who's like in that starting phase where they're just trying to get their first like batch of clients, build a portfolio, they're in what I call yes mode. And you should mm-hmm. be in that phase where you're mm-hmm. saying yes to anyone that'll pay you money. And this is because essentially to say it as nice as I can, you're a noob, right? Like you sure. don't have, you're not proven. You don't have anyone who will really vouch for you. You don't have the experience and track record of somebody who's been doing this for years. And so therefore you have to build that up. And the only way to build that up is to just say yes to whoever mm-hmm. will, will say yes to you. So you got lots of passion. We started this, this gig because we love something. And for a lot of your listeners, it's photography, my background, music production. Uh, for some people it can be designed for something. It's, and it's always some sort of creativity, passion driven thing. And the, the things that we're lacking are skills. There are a lot of skills that we lack. Some of it might still be in our creative niche where we're just not quite as good as we should be at the skill that we are as a creative. But a lot of times it's not that. It is the lack of other skills that we have to start building up as a freelancer. Yeah. We have to start acquiring these other skills because the second you decide to become a freelancer, a, by definition, a professional earning money for what you do, mm-hmm. Now you have to start taking these other skills seriously because you are no longer a hobbyist. That's the archetype here. And I'll pause here if there's any questions or anything you want to chat over based on what I've said so far at this level one freelancer. No, I love this. And I I have spoken to people before about the fact that it is, especially at the beginning, and I love the video game analogy, you're looking around and you do, you know, it's very easy to start looking at someone who's way ahead of you and feel like, oh gosh, I'm never going to get there or I need to get there tomorrow which is impossible. Like anybody who feels like they're behind, you have to take, you know, the journey of a thousand miles, right? It begins with a single step. But I also talk to people about the fact that like, as much as you're looking ahead and wishing that you were in that future place, there are things that I miss about being new. And you can never be new after you're not new anymore. You can go be new at other things, but there are, there is a certain amount of that kind of magic when your passion is that high that you have to really struggle to to maintain as you move through the rest of your experience. So like relish that, even if you feel like, oh gosh, I'm not sure that my clients are going to get the most polished professional experience. You know what they're getting? They are getting you killing yourself to make every single photo shoot or whatever else the very best it could be. And that is its own brand of magic. So that's all I'll Jump in no, well said. So let's talk about how to get out of this. If that's cool with you, like how do we get to the next level as yeah. a level one noob, yes mode freelancer? I kind of already alluded to this, but it's just building the skills that you lack right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and even maybe before that is identifying the skills that you actually lack. One of the most important skills as a freelancer is people skills. Like I, I cannot overstate this. And the, I rarely meet a highly successful freelancer, especially in the photography space, mm-hmm who lack people skills. They're usually great to, to chat and hang out with. You're no exception. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's the area that I would start with. If you are struggling to get out of this mode is just like, learn to like to be around people. That's, and that's, I think that's a skill that can be learned. Some people don't like being around people, but if you just start hanging around people that you actually genuinely like and genuinely want to be around, I think that's a great place to start, to start building those people skills. If you can just really engage with people and people like you, that's how many industries get started. And there's other skills in marketing and sales. There's other like ways you can be a better creative, but I think the people skills is the foundation that everything else is built on. Assuming you're good enough at what you do. And even if you're not amazing at what you do, I still say there's always a client at the level that you're at as a, as a freelancer. Like if you're a level one, yes mode noob, there's somebody out there that, that either can't afford or cannot even qualify to work with the level six. So you will, you will pair up together. So no matter what level you're at, there's somebody out there who is on your level as a client that you can connect with. Ooh, I like that. I guess I had never really thought about it like that, but that's absolutely true. The people skills thing, I say this all the time, like learning how to use a camera is there's a finite amount of 
buttons. Like <laughs> there's it, the technology is not rocket science. It's not that hard. It you know it's challenging enough, and certainly I'm not discounting what it takes to learn how to make a good photograph. But a lot of people can do that. Not everybody is great at that interpersonal thing. Like I think that a great portrait in particular really comes from putting your subject at ease or on edge or whatever the look is that you're going for. You're kind of in the driver's seat on a lot of that. So unless you are pure documentary kind of hiding in the shadows and even still you're going to have to do things like talk to somebody about hiring you. And so you're absolutely right. Like those people skills are so important. And for those of you listening, and I know that there are a lot who sort of self-identify as introverted and, you know, you hear like, go get comfortable being around people and you just kind of want to crawl into bed. I would argue that, you know, that's not so much a disqualifier as it is probably going to dictate your niche a little bit. Like that is going to steer you toward perhaps smaller groups of people or working one-on-one with people. Introverts are not anti-social. They are just social in a different way. And I think it's a, it's a subtle but really profound difference when it comes to how we show up as freelancers is if we are trying to hawk something that no one truly wants because it doesn't take into account what they need or want, we're just passionate about it. You're not serving the client and you're going to mm-hmm. struggle to get clients because of that. But if you shift to what is the market or the client or the whatever term you want to use here, what did they want or need? What are they looking for already? Then it becomes less of like, I have to sell myself to you and more about they're going to buy from me. And that's a mm-hmm. big difference when it comes to the, the dynamic of, the, of the, the sale. Okay. So level one, you're basically, I mean, maybe level one is like not even quite yet in business, right? Like you are just starting to figure out what it is you don't know. <laughs> yeah. So then we're into level two. You're kind of going after it. How do you get out of that into that next area? If you are good at what you do, you listen to the, the people you talk to, you're sharpening your other skills above and beyond that. Mm-hmm. It won't be that long until you're level two, which is I call the generalist. Um, and this is where typically what I say is kind of the button seat jobs that a lot of freelancers find themselves in. And what I mean by button seat jobs is if you look at Fiverr or Upwork and you're looking for a gig, like you're looking for somebody to hire because I've, I've done this before in my past. It's a bunch of grids and it's a transaction. So I'm looking for a butt in a seat. Mm-hmm. I don't really care who it is. That person might be full-time. They might be part-time, but I'm looking for a butt in a seat that matches this thing. I need an editor for my podcast. Yeah. I need this little thing, a, a butt in a seat essentially. And this is generally where a lot of people find themselves earlier in their career is they get into these services that are like, hey, they're in need, right? There, people are looking for those services. There's a demand for it, but there's not a, a lot of differentiator. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot, of, a lot to differentiate you from the, the butt next to you. So for the client perspective, they don't necessarily care which butt is in the seat. You're struggling to say no to people. You're still in yes mode and you're trying to appeal to everyone. When you try to appeal to everyone, you appeal to no one. Right. Because of this, you're going to get beaten down on pricing. You might still get consistent clients, but they're underpaying you. These types of people are more focused on what's it going to cost me versus what are you going to do for me? Mm -hmm. And again, you can start to see why you don't want to be in this level for too long. It could be good because you're finally starting to make some money. It could be good because you're starting to build your portfolio. It could be good because you've got your your hands in a lot of different little pies (laughs) so you can figure out what you like and you don't like. Mm -hmm. However, living in this area for too long is detrimental to your long-term brand because if you haven't found a way to differentiate yourself in some way, shape, or form as the go-to person for X, Y, and or Z, and found a way to differentiate yourself to where you can detach your pricing from the service because mm-hmm. your value based on a button a seat, then you're then you're setting yourself up to be the person who's just known for like, hey, he'll do this thing for you. He'll he'll edit your photos for cheap. He'll like, and you don't want to be that. I was going to say, I mean, this, I think actually with photographers, like you can actually be a generalist photographer where you're, it's not just, I'm a headshot photographer. It's I shoot headshots and families and newborns and seniors. And you can use a camera in a lot of different ways and you can be good at doing a lot of different things. But if you don't start to specialize in something you fall into exactly the trap that you were talking about, which is the, if you appeal to everybody, you appeal to nobody. And what happens is that person gets stuck in the like wash cycle of constant price shoppers. Like they're just always being, you know, bid against. And because they don't have anything where they're separating, as you 
very well put, like separating the offer from the price there, you know, and it it like beats you down over time. I feel like that is a sort of a demoralizing position to be in for any long sustained period of time. This is where so many people go to die, like yeah. as a freelancer, not yeah. physically, but they, they die as a freelancer because it's too hard. They're not making enough to make a full-time living. They're in what I call zombie land mode where they're making just enough to survive, but not nearly enough to thrive and maybe not enough to survive enough to feel like they're doing something good. And then they mm-hmm. stay in this level for forever until yeah. they're just like, I've got to get a job. This is not working. Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen people that do that because I've seen plenty that have done that. Absolutely. Uh, but let's talk, let's talk, let's talk about how to get out of level two here. If you're trying to get out of this, it is literally, you're, you've been in yes mode for forever. You've been a button in a lot of different seats. It's time to start figuring out which of these areas you want to move into. And there's something that I teach that is, that is not something I came up with, but this is the PSP framework. Passion, skills, profit, right? And of all the different clients you work with, just think of your like your favorite client you've ever worked with. And you try to list out all the different niches you could serve. And that's a combination of the types of clients, small business owners, families, the types of clients you could work with, and then the services you could offer, headshots, family photography. I, again, I don't know all the specifics of yeah. your world super well. And then you list out, you can even rate this, put it on a spreadsheet if you're a spreadsheet junkie like me, or if you're not, just feel it out if you're a feeler. On a scale of one to five, how passionate am I about this service or this mm-hmm. type of client? On a scale of one to five, how um, how are, how is my skill set when mm-hmm. serving this this type of client? Uh, profit how, on a scale of one to five, how much money does this right. could this bring in? Because not all niches and type, types of clients have the same level of money. And there's a quote that somebody said recently that I heard. It's, it's startling, but I still like the sentiment here. Is <laughs> and this is going to get a lot of enemies here. <laughs> solve rich people problems, they pay more. Yeah, yeah. And that is, it's just like, I worked with minimum wage employees. I worked like bands that I, work, that I would record working at Taco Bell, minimum wage employees, mm-hmm. legitimately. I've worked on that side of the market and I've also worked with, you know, funded companies hiring me for consulting who have hundreds of employees, right? Mm-hmm. And that type of client is a lot easier to sell to yeah. than the person who's, you know, they, they've got three members of the band working at Taco Bell, two work somewhere else, and they've got to save up for a year to re- afford your services. Right. You can still make money in that world. Don't get me wrong. That's what I built my entire mm-hmm. career on, but it comes with a lot of drawbacks. So that's why I put profit in there. It's not like you have to have a five in it, but the higher that number on the profit scale, the, the easier it's going to be. You're swimming downstream versus upstream. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think I appreciate you saying like, I'm going to make a lot of enemies with something like that, because of course, you know, many of us, I think, want to serve populations, ideally that, you know, aren't just lifestyles of the rich and famous. It's, I agree. I think that, you know, we, many of us don't fall into that category. So it's not who we necessarily feel most aligned with. But it is good to go in eyes wide open, knowing that selling is harder when somebody is strapped for cash and your business model may need to adjust in order to accommodate higher, let's say, you know, volume of clients. And, you know, if you're charging less money because that's what your clients can afford, then you're going to have to do more work to make the same amount of money. So in any niche or any market, there is an upper limit to what you can charge for your services. And the more saturated that market and the less money that your clients have, the lower that upper limit is. Mm-hmm. But if that's the case for your market, you have a really low limit because you're working with people who are not super privileged and rich. And maybe there's a lot of competition. The way you make your profit in that world is becoming the most efficient mm-hmm. and having the best systems and processes and even automation, delegation, all those things that bring your time for fulfillment down. And my old podcast co-host was a master at this. He was a pun accident, accidentally pun there. He's a mastering engineer uh-huh. and he was charging like $60, $70 per song, which is really low in the mastering world. But he built a multi six figure mastering studio off of that because he had become a master of systems and automations. And he had everything dialed into where he had like scripts written on his computer to bring the files into his DAW and fade the endings and like automatically put the thing to the loudest point of the song, which is what he needed to hear as a mastering engineer. And he could just open up a session and in 10 seconds can make a decision on what he needs to change. And he could, he just got to be a master of quickly and efficiently doing things that took other master engineers two to three to four to five to 10 X the amount of time to do. Wow. So that's, that's the game we play is if you're going to be in a lower price per client or average client revenue type of business model, you've got to find ways to find efficiencies that other people haven't found. And the less efficient you are, 
the more that hurts you, not mm-hmm. the client, because mm-hmm. you can only charge so much. So you have to become more efficient. And that's a whole other topic and whole other episode yeah. that I didn't mean to get it's into today, one. but it's worth talking about at some point. Yeah. We're moving from level two into level three. Yeah. As you start to look at that PSP framework and you're kind of deciding this is the thing or these are the couple of things that are are like where I want to kind of, you know, plant my flag. Exactly. I love that analogy, planting your flag. That's where we get to level three, which is the traction phase. And this is where if you if you've ever if you've gotten to this level, or you're currently at this level or you have gotten past this level and you're looking back, you can agree with me on this. This is where things start to click and you feel like a real business owner because things are starting to work emails are coming to your inbox. You're getting referrals. Like you're maybe getting some website traffic from organic sources or even social media sources. Like it's just, it's a good place where you're in that like low high part-time to low full-time earnings as a freelancer Mm -hmm. generally is what this looks like. And the numbers can be everywhere for all different niches because you're starting to have some set, some success with some sort of niche. People know you're good. People are telling other people about you. You are, again, you've planted that flag and you said, I am here to do this along with this comes the pitfalls, right? Every every level has a pitfall and a danger. And this is where we get into the what I call the hope marketing uh, word of mouth death trap. Um, mm-hmm. And this is actually one of the topics I pitched to you as far as like something we could talk about. So I'll, I'll breeze over this, but generally speaking, and this is this is like another like big pillar of my entire brand of six-figure creative that I will like, I will die on this mm-hmm. is word of mouth is a death trap. And there's something called survivorship bias that freelancers don't consider when they consider referrals as a client acquisition method. And I'll try to break this down as clear as I can. So stop and ask questions or say, Brian, you're confusing me if I'm if I'm confusing you at all. Or or if you think I'm confusing your listeners. Sure, sure. Word about death trap is this. Uh, if I say, Anime, what is the number one source of clients in your niche? What is your number one source of clients? <laughs> uh, I know what you're asking for. <laughs> Um, yeah, word of mouth. Right. And, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with word of mouth. That's the thing. Like, it's not like a gotcha statement. Like, yeah, you're great at what you do. You've been doing this for a long time. So naturally you will have enough past clients, current clients, friends, family, your name is known in this industry, in your area so that you can keep your calendar full and your roster full with word of mouth clients. And here's the death trap. It's everyone listening right now who is not at that level. Anime has gotten there for a long period of of maybe struggle, pain, hard work, determination, maybe some uh, lucky advantage that that she has that you don't have as a listener. So what can happen is you hear that word of mouth is her number one source of clients. So therefore, that should be my number one source of clients. And the death trap is you are ignoring all the other freelancers that never made it to Anime's position. And therefore... They, they're not telling you that word of mouth didn't work for them. You never hear from those people. Those people had to go back and get day jobs. Right. So you only hear from the survivors who made it to the point where word of mouth is their number one source of clients. And if you're good at what you do, that will, that's an inevitability. So what do you do if word of mouth isn't keeping your calendar full, isn't enough to sustain you? Well, that's where you have to start learning the other client acquisition methods that are out there and start, start generating leads instead of waiting for leads. Yeah. So. Again, that's a whole other topic, whole other episode we even have. I'll put that on the show notes link that I'll give you for, for this on episode 200, 225 of our podcast called How to Build Your Own Client Acquisition Machine. There's a lot that goes into that. But I will say the, the downside of this traction phase is you get lulled in this false sense of security. You might start getting word of mouth. You might start filling up your roster. You can start raising your rates. It's a wonderful feeling. But as freelancers, we have these natural ebbs and flows, feasts and famines, especially in the photography niche where you're doing family photography, you have these big peaks and valleys where I think spring and fall is huge for you. And then maybe summer and especially winter might be not so fast for you. Right. And again, some, sometimes you don't have any, any way to, you can't change the seasons sure. and, or anything, but you can change your lead flow throughout that time. These are learned skills. There's a lot that goes into this. I'm not going to pretend like it's easy, but it's a learned skill that you can start taking client acquisition into your own hands. And the time to start paying attention to that and doubling down on that is when you are in this level three traction phase where you've proven what they call product market fit. The thing that you are selling is a thing that people want and you know what service is sold to what people in your area And you're still kind of figuring out what that price point is. Maybe there's some price elasticity there where you're kind of figuring out what's my upper limit. Mm -hmm. But that's where we've got to start doubling down on client acquisition and build things that are going to bring us in clients long term. And we can chat about any of that if you want, but it's it's a lot. But this is where we need to do a couple things to kind of get out of this phase into the next level. And that is 
user free time to work on client acquisition. Yep. Improving your offer as a as a freelancer. And I think your offer is awesome where you're doing the yearbook club. Like that's a unique thing where I can't just go price shop that to every other photographer out there. Right. It, it's something called pricing confusion where it's not just a button a seat. It's not just a flat rate for a shoot. It's not just per hour or whatever. Mm-hmm. It is like this thing that's like you get all these wonderful, cool things and you're paying per month. And so it's now not, it's not apples to apples. It's apples to oranges. Yeah. So now because of that, you kind of have a monopoly on this offer because no one seems to be directly ripping you off, at least at your level in your area. Yeah. Maybe that's changed since the last time we talked, but I don't think that has. Yeah. Well, I teach it. So I'm, yeah. I'm ready for people to, uh, to start doing that more, but absolutely all through my career, I feel like the things that have helped catapult me and I'm going to use the phrase to the next level have oh. been things, <laughs> have been things where I was like, I'm going to try this thing that nobody else is doing. And I'm just going to lean into it or I'm going to try this thing that I, you know, I see, but it's not very common. And I ultimately those it is easier to go left when everybody else is going right. Yeah, there's and there's one more thing to kind of focus on in this in this level that is usually not always figured out to the to the maximum ability. And that is making sure you're focused on the right client because you can't have traction and you can have a really cool service and a great offer, but it may not be offered to the best client for your business. We're not running a charity here. And that's the thing about business is you can be a wonderfully successful business and then shove as much of that money into charity however you want to help the people that you love and care about. But when it comes to building business, we have to, as best we can, as long as we're not going against our ethics or morals, we got to think about the business fundamentals of what is a better business to build. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a lot of gray area there that I don't want to get into. Like, I'm not going to ever tell someone to do something they don't want to do. Yeah. But just all things being equal, that's an easier business to run when you're working with clients that, that are that have funds. Like, so I guess it's the same thing I said earlier, solve rich people problems, they pay better. It's just a more jarring way of saying it that way. Yeah. yeah. No. And I mean, it is, I think it's probably bears repeating in my industry and photography, because I think that that is a trap that a lot of people get stuck in. And I think that ultimately, again, I'm all for, you can set your business up any way you want, but because photography is a time for money business that can only be automated and outsourced so far, the ultimate thing that you have to come to grips with is that if your desire to serve a particular community does not align with the business model that you want, there are other ways to work that, which is go make a bunch of money doing this and then funnel either the extra time or the extra money into doing the thing that sort of fills your cup. I have to agree with that. Level four, I just called the pro. I mean, there's probably a million ways you can name any of these levels. The pro, you're a pro. Like your full-time income, you're probably above 50K. Uh, You've got some decent systems built out because you've done this enough times. You have some repeatability in like your delivery. You have like your onboarding systems. You have your delivery systems. You've got software set up. Like you've you've got it dialed in because you don't grow to that level without having some of these things done. You've got a decent grasp on pricing. You've you're not like the cheapest person, hopefully. Mm -hmm. You are, you're probably not the most expensive person at this income level. You've got to figure it out, right? Like you're probably feeling good. There's some stability going on. Um, You've got some source of clients. It's probably just word of mouth unless you are like following this to a T and you're like, you heard me say like, don't fall into the word of mouth death trap. And you've built out client acquisition systems through some sort of channels. All right. All that sounds great. But here's where things start to fall apart as this level four pro is. And I, this is from, by the way, this is, these are all the levels I've gone through myself and many people that I know have gone through. So this is me not casting stones. This is me just, this is how it was where you work too much. (laughs) And there's the stress of taking on what I call bill paying work. And this is the sad reality that we all have to face as freelancers is not every project we do is going to be something we are fully into and love the client and love the, the services we're offering and just, that's, that's reality, especially in this phase where you're, you're pro, it's your full focus. So sometimes when things are slow or when you need more money, you just got to say yes to, to, to crap gigs. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Because of that, you tend to work too much because you never know where the next client's going to come from. Yeah. So you're just trying to eat while you can, right? So this, and, and this is where I, in my, my longest week, oh God, I worked over a hundred hours it basically just worked until I couldn't, fell asleep on the sofa next to the thing, got up and worked until I couldn't. I did that for like a week straight. And then the last day I pulled a 24 hour shift because we had to get the album mastered, but to ship it out via next same day, whatever, that Friday, it was a whole ordeal. That is unsustainable the older we get. I'm 36 now. Yeah. I was probably 26 when that happened. 
You can do that at 26. You can't do that at 26. And you can't do that with a family either. Sure. So obviously we're all in different places, life and age and family status. But I don't think anyone wants to do weeks like that for long term. Like right. that's something we can do occasionally, but that's something we can't keep up. And if you do, you're going to sacrifice so many parts of your life that now you're building your business around your life. Or I'm sorry, your life around your business instead of the opposite, where you should be building your business to support your life. Right. So we've got to start getting out of this. Any questions about that? Or can I kind of talk about like getting out of this, this nope. mess? I, okay. yep. I want to hear how <laughs> your formula yeah. for getting out. I mean, I wouldn't call it a formula. It's just what has worked for me and what I've seen work for a lot of people yeah. is twofold. If you want to earn more money, there's only two ways to do it. You either uh, get more clients or make each client worth more. Yep. Right. And, and that's like, that's the, that's the basis. Yep. And we talked about getting more clients. That's just what we call the, the client acquisition uh, skill set. But let's talk about the other way of making each client worth more. I already alluded to one of those ways earlier where we systemize, delegate, automate things. We speed up processes. We cut out crap that shouldn't be there. And we bring our level of time down per project. That's one way of making each client worth more because they're not paying you more, but they're worth more per hour that you put in. Yes. And so that's one way to make clients worth more. The other way is to literally get your prices raised. And there's a couple ways to raise prices that are worth talking about. The first is what I call dynamic pricing. And that is just, I said, I said it earlier, when times are slow, you may have to lower your rates to like fill in gaps. And when times are booming, you've just got to skyrocket prices in order to like, essentially you're rejecting clients by pricing them out. And there's pros and cons to this and I'm not going to get into all the pros and cons of that, but that's one way to do it. If, if my calendar's booked up or if someone's looking for really far, far out uh, gigs, I'm going to charge the most for that. Mm -hmm. um, and if I am like two weeks out and I need to fill a slot then or I had a cancellation or something, then I'm going to bring the price down to, to accommodate for that. The other method is uh, having a better monetization method. And that is like for you, actually, the yearbook club is just by default a better monetization method because instead of a client paying you one time and then they don't come back to you again until they remember that they need more services from you, mm -hmm. they're paying you a flat monthly fee and you're proactively reaching out and getting them to book services. So by, by the way you have your business set up, they are going to consume and need more of your services. So right. a client is going to be worth more to you, not just over the year, but over the lifetime of them. Right. So that is the other way is just finding ways to make clients worth more. And you can do things like upsells, cross sells. You can do things like additional services. Like there's a bunch of ways to do this, but that's the way you got to do it is just make each client worth more. You can do by raising your prices, offering more services, better monetization method, recurring revenue services, et cetera. Any questions about all that so far? No, I love it. I don't know. And I would be interested in, obviously, again, this is a conversation probably for another time. I don't know that off the top of my head, I can come up with a good way for most of my audience members to have a dynamic pricing mo uh, model. It would probably be really confusing and it would probably be hard to manage over time because of yeah. like brand. But what I do see is people who are... I get asked a lot, should I raise my rates all at once? You know, if I, I need to make a big jump. I just ran my numbers and realized that I'm like way undercharging. Should I triple my prices all at once or should I like inch them up? So they're almost putting themselves in a dynamic pricing, but it's all increased. Like I'm going to increase by a hundred dollars every three months or whatever. And I am always pro just rip the bandaid off, triple your prices because otherwise you're just going to be like, you know, people come in and then you lose them and then they come in and then you lose them. If you jump by triple, it's going to take you, I always say, about six months to start to find your people in that at that level. However, <laughs> and in the meantime, maybe you're taking clients one offs because they say, hey, I need a photographer on Tuesday and you're free and you're like, OK, cool, I'll do that for cheap. But that's not on your website and that's not in your brand you know, that you're sort of like reestablishing yourself. You bring up a really good point, And this is something worth just mentioning is uh, snowflake syndrome. Uh, every niche has snowflake syndrome, every niche, right. every industry. Photographers are no different. Music producers are no different. They, they look at their services in their industry and it's like, well, I'm such a special, We're unique different. snowflake. <laughs> Whatever Brian says can't pertain to my photo studio. So yeah. I get this from time to time. So I always just say, I challenge that when people say it doesn't work in my industry, I challenge that. However, you are most likely right in this regard where the specifics of the photography niche, especially if you're not in recurring revenue uh, services, 
maybe difficult because in my world, I'd stack my stuff way right. in advance. And photography may not be the same way because it generally seems to be lower time commitment. You're not working with a client for weeks on something. Like, so right. it's, a, it's a bit different. I, I'll acknowledge that. But I just want to say, before you throw anything out, listening to the show, think, how can I not, I can't. It's not like, I can't make this work. It's just, how can I make this work? Absolutely. How can I, yeah. And let me go back and reiterate that, like, I built my entire business by saying, well, maybe we can do that. So, like... Yeah. Prove me wrong, folks. <laughs> yeah. See, the fact that you went into to recurring uh, revenue services or like to build MRR or monthly recurring revenue, to me, proves that you are going outside above and beyond yeah, yeah. the norm of what people typically do in that space. But yeah, whatever it is, as long as you're raising rates in a way that's sustainable and you're not pricing yourself out of your own market, continue to raise rates. And I've, I've seen both ways work where people just like are way undercharging for way too long and you triple your rates all of a sudden and you lose half your clients. But wait. I tripled my rates, but lost half my clients. I'm that working works. less and making more. <laughs> wow. Like it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. The math is good. All right. So that's, that's basically level four of the pro. So level five is the six figure creative. So it's on brand for my podcast called yeah. the six figure creative. So I have to call level five, the six figure creative. And this is obviously like, it's easy to know if you're in this level or not. You're making hundred grand or more a year in whatever the equivalent is for your currency. At this point, you've got to have solid systems in place. You are dependable. You are teachable. You are open to change. You're not stuck in your ways. Like I've rarely seen anyone at this level who are any of those things. Yeah. Uh, you are from most freelancers, unless you are, have been following my stuff, you are probably here because word of mouth has worked for you thus far. And you're probably still, you've built your word of mouth snowball to the point where you're able to sustain yourself. You still have the issue of only just referrals as your one source of clients. So that's still that danger that you could have a dry spell, have a downturn, whatever, and you're not doing any lead gen activities or client acquisition activities on the other side of things to kind of always have a, a two or three legged stool instead of just the one leg. Yeah. But this is a great place to be. And in this world, you can stay here for as long as you want. This is a great business. And, and honestly, actually, I even have a show an episode called why six figures is minimum wage for freelancers. And I go into all the arguments why the minimum you should be shooting for as a freelancer is six figures. So in some regards, level five, it feels like the top, but that's just the beginning in my, in my opinion, after you talk about taxes, insurance as a U.S. citizen, processing fees, all these things, wipe your income down to where your take home pay can be anywhere from 50 to $70,000 a year at a hundred thousand dollars. So to make what is considered a decent salary in the U S 50 to $75,000, takes a hundred grand. Yep. So that's why I say it's minimum wage, especially in a city like Nashville, LA, New York, something, you know, these other cities with high living expenses. Yeah. So there may be a case where you want to go above and beyond this. Sure. And that's where we start talking about like the next level. I'm, I'm reasoning through it a little bit because so few people are at six figures. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to like, we spent all our time at the bottom of the pyramid and going to the top, it's less people, less, less time. Yeah. But this is where we have to find how do we want to get to that next level? And there's a few ways to do it. This is where we start talking about getting to level six, which is what I consider the graduation from from freelancing. You've graduated from just a simple freelancer to a true entrepreneur. It takes a little different type of brain. You've got to be, this is where we have the creative versus the entrepreneur. Many people are 100% creative, 0% entrepreneur. That is a lot of people out there. Some people are 100% entrepreneur, 0% creative. There's a lot of business owners out there like that. People on my show that listen to my stuff are generally somewhere... 50-50, 50-50, yep. 75, 25, something like that. So you can kind of chart your own path, but there's something that I call like a product ladder that is worth considering if you're trying to get from six figures to multiple six figures as a freelancer. And this is how I did it. And so people can also consider doing something like this themselves. You have the uh, done for you services, which as a photographer, that is literally what you do is you do the service for them. Mm-hmm. Then the second tier on that product ladder is done with you, where you you help someone do the thing themselves. So it could be getting someone uh, who's maybe they don't want to pay for the yearbook club, or maybe they want to learn how to do photos themselves and take photos of their families. Maybe they travel a lot and they're not, you know, they can't bring anime with them to Bali for two months, you know, to, to, yes, you to take photos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of money though. If anyone so, out there is listening and wants to take me to Bali for two <laughs> year or two months, definitely give me a call. <laughs> yeah. So if, when that's the case, you can work with somebody to help. It's done with you to help you do the thing. So mm-hmm. you're teaching them the skills, you're giving them feedback on things, you're showing them how you like to do things. And this is a wonderful business model. Obviously it takes less time than it does to fulfill on the services themselves. Right. Generally speaking, the bottom tier on this kind of like product ladder or top tier, whichever way you want to look at it, 
and this is generally the cheapest solution, is do it yourself. And this is where courses, solutions where you're not directly still involved one-to-one with the client Mm -hmm. to help solve the thing. And I, my, actually, this is what I jumped to immediately as a mixing engineer. I put a course out called From Shit to Gold. And that was the very first product that I ever put out. And uh, it sold really well. And it essentially added a whole other six-figure revenue stream to my already six-figure freelance business. So that's, that was when I made that transition around 2015 from the freelancer to the entrepreneur who is like, now I have multiple income streams. Mm-hmm. Shortly after that, I launched my Airbnb, another six figure income stream. Yep. You, st- you start to see where like, you start to spot opportunities to earn money doing things that are fun and yeah. highly leveraged. And so that's where you start getting out to this graduation phase where you're, you got your finger in a bunch of different pies. That's where well, I'm at today is level six graduation. I'm just in constant graduation phase. I love that. And I think that it is one of those things, as you were talking about these six levels, I was thinking about, you know, I went through for sure all of these as a photographer. I'm still a photographer. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working in that. And then when I started my education business, I was back at the beginning But I was at the beginning a lot less time. Like I knew, I sort of knew the markers and was like, okay, this isn't going to be sustainable. Now I'm going to move. And I wasn't thinking about it. I didn't have these names for it. I didn't have six, you know, tiers specifically kind of mapped out in my brain. But you do start to learn from the process. And so it becomes more quickly repeatable. And that's where something like becoming a mentor or seeking mentorship um, can help you move through some of these uncomfortable spaces more quickly. I think that when I started as a photographer, education was really hard to come by. I, I went to the bookstore and like bought several books on how to run a photography business, none of which have any valuable information in them pertaining to my current business. These days, I feel like there's a lot of good information. In some ways, the hardest part is weeding through everything that's out there to try and find something that resonates with you and sort of, you know, helps you. We all learn differently. So I always know that if I lost everything in my life right now, everything I could build it back. Yeah. And that's why you see so many people who go like rich people who go bankrupt. And then years later, they're billionaires again. It's like, because they learned the skills and there's maybe some other advantages there, but all, all things being equal, if you learn these skills of, the, the other skills, what I consider the full stack freelancer, you're great at your creative thing and you have these other skills, you are undefeatable. Yeah. Is that, a, is that even a word? I don't yeah. know. But to me, it's like, you can build it back. Like you, you mentioned everything you've, or the, the new business you built, you were at the beginning a short amount of time. It's the same for me. It took me six years for my freelance business to be a six figure business. But then like my software company, the last software company I launched, we were six figures within the first year. Mm-hmm. And the newest business I've launched we are working our way to be six figures a month. So it's like, it's a completely different thing when you've learned all these different skills and you understand the numbers and metrics. And this is to me, the places where I feel most creative is in business because to build a business that's sustainable, it is a business you love to do. It's a business that doesn't feed just yourself, but other people with employees like that to me, I have to solve a lot of problems. And to me, problem solving is the ultimate form of creativity because I love to look at something that seems unsolvable and it's a puzzle and it's fun. And my brain goes a million miles an hour, even faster than I talk to solve these problems. There's some problem beyond that that I don't know much about, like probably building six figures and invested income. I don't know. (laughs) I'm trying to figure out what level seven be, but yeah, I haven't got there yet. So I'm I'm trying to figure out like what, what else I can do out there that's, that's beyond this. I love it. Well, Brian, this is amazing. And this is, it's a long episode relative to most of my episodes, but this is, uh, was absolutely worth every single minute. I feel like it is so important to identify these things sometimes because it makes it feel more doable. It gives you something to aim for so that you don't feel like, well, now I'm, you know, whatever I'm doing right now, this is just what I'm going to be doing forever. It sounds like you are going to put together a very nice little, uh, podcast series for everybody. Tell them where they can find you and find that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just put a link, sixfigurecreative.com slash Tonkin. Uh, I would put your first name, but I even so struggle hard. to spell that. So yep. I just figured Tonkin is the easier word um, that we can redirect. And I'll create a whole page that's just like all the episodes that I mentioned will have direct links to, to that. I'll put a link to our client acquisition toolkit for anyone who's trying to learn the client acquisition world. And probably a few other things in there that might be helpful for you based on what we said. If I do miss something, then just email me podcast at Six Figure Creative and I will try to add it to the list. Um, but our podcast is called Six Figure Creative. But just go to that link, sixfigurecreative.com slash Tonkin, and that will have everything we discussed on this show. 
Cool. And that's T-O-N-K-E-N. I have two hard names to spell. <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's a pain. Well, Brian, it has been a blast. I can't wait to have you back on. But uh, but thank you so much. And I, yeah. I hope you have a great day. Yeah, I would love to come back. Just, just hit me up. You know where to find me. Absolutely. Well, that's it for this week's episode of This Can't Be That Hard. I'll be back same time, same place next week. In the meantime, you can find more information about this episode, along with all the relevant links, notes and downloads at thiscan'tbethathard.com slash learn. If you like the podcast, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Even better, share the love by leaving a review in iTunes. And as always, thanks so much for joining me. I hope you have a fantastic week.